everyone. Uh, my name is Hector. And today I would like to talk to you about the technology um, behind IPFS and how it works in ways that are hopefully easy to understand to people that are not extremely technical or people that are new to this kind of technology. Uh, the first thing to mention is that IPFS is made of many parts that are themselves part of a wider uh, ecosystem. For example, the networking layer on IPFS is called libp 2 p And libp 2 p is not only used for IPFS, but it's also going to be used for things like the second version of the Ethereum blockchain. <laughs> IPFS, um, we see it as a building block in the journey towards a better web, which will be a peer-to-peer -peer web. Um, we see two types of advantages in this type of uh, distributed web. Uh, on one side, we think that in a world which is more and more connected and where digital data plays a bigger and role, um, distributed systems um, provide the technical advancement that allows to actually address the challenges of the future. On the other side, we believe that data should be free and that distributed technologies can be used to return the power to the users, uh, splitting and removing it from larger actors like corporations and government. Uh, given that we all run a fantastic computer that it's normally in our pockets and that we use it to produce data and to send data around, uh, it is weird that that data has to travel through a third party that will copy it, that will analyze it, that will monetize it before it travels back to the actual destination, um, which is the users that are interested in that data. So we think that there should be a way which actually can avoid uh, that part. Um, IPFS is not the answer to all these problems, but it's the, it is the answer to some of them. And as I said, it's a building block on what we see as the next uh, web generation or what we call Web3. Uh, what is exactly IPFS? Uh, it's the interplanetary file system. So let's start with the file system part. What is a file system? Essentially, it's files and folders. Uh, just what you're used to, any file, and files inside folders, and folders inside other folders. Uh, why interplanetary? Because it was conceived as as a way of upgrading the web in, in a way that you will not have to do anything special. If you have people accessing the web from Mars and they want to open a website and it's okay, a, a request from Mars is going to take one hour to go and come back to Earth to actually reach the server, obtain the content and copy and retrieve that response. If someone is accessing the same content from Mars again later, they shouldn't have to come back to Earth to obtain that content again. The actual network, the actual web protocol, should support that if the content is already available on Mars, uh, it should come directly from Mars without having to do all this round trip. So this is why the interplanetary name is in it. It's like how do we upgrade our, our networks and our protocols in a way that they can um, work better with these uh, sort of uh, challenges. As we're going to see, IPFS is distributed by design. There are no central servers um, to store the content. There is no central server contacted to obtain the content. And I'm going to run you through the key technologies that make this possible. And in order to do that, we have to think first, how do we put content normally on the web? Uh, typically, when you want to put something on the web, you want to upload that content somewhere. Anyone wanted to access that content will have to download it from that location. Uh, with IPFS, things are slightly different. In IPFS, you run an application called the IPFS peer, and you become yourself a server. You don't upload content anywhere when you want to put it in the network. Instead, you have your peer uh, make it discoverable by everyone else in that network. Uh, you may say, how is this like really different from the current web where I could just run a web server on my actual device and put my, my website there? And the answer is that the difference 
is that IPFS uses something called content addressing. Content addressing replaces location addressing. Um, as I told you, um, a file system has files and folders, and this is very clear when you're navigating in your own computer, uh, in your own file system, in your local file system. Um, but if you think of it, the web is no different. Uh, you still have the same files and folder structure. You still have the same sort of paths uh, taking you to the content that you want, except that you have prefixed those paths with a domain name, which is a location, uh, meaning that whenever you want to access that content, you have to go to that location to get it. Um, in IPFS, you're also going to be retrieving content from remote locations, but the key difference there is that you don't need to worry at first about the location of the content. Uh, instead of accessing content by the location of where that content is, you're going to access content by something called the content identifier. Uh, the content is still somewhere, and you will have to find where it to retrieve it. But it does not matter anymore precisely where it is. Um, this is called content addressing. In order to have content addressing, you need to generate these content identifiers so that you can address content uh, using them. We call those uh, CIDs. And they're essentially a cryptographic fingerprint that you can produce from any piece of content. Basically, you're going to apply something called a hash function to any file, to the content of any file. And you're going to obtain that ugly looking uh, identifier, which is a fingerprint, which would be different for every different piece of content, but will always be more or less the same size, the same length, uh, regardless of how much content you're processing, so a big file. Uh, will produce exactly the same type of identifier as a small type. This identifier can be reproduced from the original piece of content uh, anytime. So it is something that you can always uh, check. It is something that you can always produce to verify that certain piece of content that you obtained from somewhere else actually matches the CID that you requested in the same place. You have to make that switch to say, like, I'm not anymore requesting content by saying fetch that content from certain location, but requesting content as fetch content with that uh, CID. It's like when you go in, in a library and you want to get a book, you say, give me the book with that name and from that author. You don't say, give me the book which is sitting at a certain uh, corridor, at a certain floor, at a certain, uh, in a certain bookshelf. Uh, as I said, in order to obtain the content identifier, we just put the files through a hash function. What about folders? Because in a file system, we have files and folders. Well, folders are just a special type of file with a list inside that points you to the actual files in that folder. So in the case of IPFS, a folder is just another file in which you have actually the file, file names of the things inside that folder and the CID corresponding to those files because everything is content addressed again, right? Uh, since it's just like any type of file, you can put it through the hash function and you can obtain a CID as well uh, for the folders. That means that we can represent a folder structure or a file system, which is the same, using uh, a content address um, tree or a content address structure like that one. Uh, what you see there, uh, there is a top level folder that has something that we call the root CID and it has two entries referenced by their fingerprints and um, which point to another two folders and those folders have another entries corresponding to files. Um, each entry has a different fingerprint because they're different things and this is uh, indicated with the colors around the fingerprint. And this content uh, address type of a structure, this content address type of graph, we call them Merkle DAX. Um, Merkle lags um, are used by IPFS because they allow you to move from this location-based addressing to this content uh, addressing uh, thing in a single step. So by replacing the location with a root CID, you can then keep your paths just like as they were before. And you can basically just make that switch that takes you from, from location to, to root CID. 
Um, one characteristic of content addressing is that, as I said, the fingerprints are unique for any type of content. So if I wanted to modify my, my tree there and I wanted to, to copy one file from one folder to another, uh, what will happen? So the first thing that we see is that we really did not copy the file because the file stays the same and it has the same identifier. So I, to IPFS, there is no notion that you have two copies of the same thing because those things are the same thing because they have the same identifier. It's not like they can live on two different locations because you're not location address, you are content address. Um, this is a property that we call deduplication and IPFS gives you a, a very good framework to start taking advantage of, of, of such property to actually uh, save uh, disk space when you have many copies of what is essentially the same thing with the small differences. Uh, secondly, what, what did change is the folder in, into which we made the copy. We added a new element to that folder. That means the fingerprint of that folder changed. That means the folder that was referencing that folder uh, also needed to update the fingerprint to the new fingerprint, so the, fing the root fin fingerprint in the end um, end up ch changing. If I switch back and forth, you can see the colors uh, flipping. Um, the moment something changes, you get a completely different CID. Uh, your previous CID still references the content as it was before, and that has not changed. Uh, the key here is that a CID always represents exactly the same piece of information, whether there is a file or a full directory structure or file system. Um, this unlocks the capacity of doing verification for any piece of data and makes IPFS a very good framework for things like append-only storage, things like blockchains or data archives, uh, in fact. As you saw there, a blockchain is just a type of Merkle DAG because each block has a hash that references the previous block in the chain. Um, so content addressing comes as a nice replacement for location-based addressing, and you can sort of drop it in and have folders and paths in a very similar way or precisely the same way uh, that you do on regular addresses. The first step when adding content to IPFS is actually that, is to get the content identifiers that identify their content. The second step is uh, to actually announce to the network, to the IPFS network, that you are providing uh, certain content that matches those content identifiers. Uh, this is where the IPFS peer as an entity comes in. So what is actually a peer? A peer in a peer-to-peer -peer system is an application which is connected to other peers and they form a network or a swarm, as we call it um, in our stack. Um, you can forget for a moment about IPFS in particular and things about peer-to-peer -peer applications in general. And, and there are certain features which every peer in a peer-to-peer -peer application should have. First, it should have a name, um, ideally, a unique name which identifies that peer in front of the whole network. And in practice, that those names are linked to a cryptographic key that allows to have uh, secure communication between two peers in the network. Um, secondly, it will need to share some functionality with other peers. So it will need to share some protocols, some services, or some language that both peers can speak and that they can perform actions to understand each other. And thirdly, um, they need to be able to discover about other peers in the network. So the first step when you boot up a peer in a P2P, in, the, in a peer-to-peer -peer network, is actually to contact other peers, which are usually hard-coded in your applications, to, to get access to the wider network, and then use those first peers that you contacted to actually discover more and more peers and start making your small network or friends. You're never connected to everyone else in the peer-to-peer -peer network. You're gonna be connected to some peers uh, in that network. Uh, doing all of that is called uh, content and peer routing, and this is achieved to something called a distributed hash table. Distributed hash tables are 
a critical service um, in peer-to-peer -peer systems normally, uh, not something IPFS specific, but rather a building block uh, that you use when you want to have a peer-to-peer -peer database um, which can be huge in size. How does it work? Uh, the principle is that rather than having every peer store all the data in the database, you're going to have each peer in your peer-to-peer -peer system store only some data of that database, some, some rows of that database. So in order to, when one peer wants to access uh, one of those rows in the database, when they want to check what, some data, they're gonna have to find which peer is actually holding that data. And the process is not random. So if we were a peer-to-peer -peer network here, and I knew that I wanted to check if some of you is actually storing some data, how would I go about it? I would just, I would just say, who's holding this data? And someone would raise their hand, hey, I have it, great. Um, but imagine that it's not just uh, 50 people. Imagine you're in a stadium with 50,000 people. Uh, you just kind of like shout like, hey, give me that data. That doesn't work. You need to be a little bit more uh, intelligent about how you're going to search for that piece of information. So in practice, what DHTs uh, do is that peers are going to store data which is kind of more similar to their peer names in the, to their peer names. What that means is that if my name is Hector, I'm more likely to store data that starts with, has a key that starts with H than someone that is called Sarah, which will be more likely to store data that starts with a key that uh, starts with S. So if I'm looking for, for some key that uh, starts with S, uh, I obviously don't have it. I'm very unlikely to keep that piece of information, but I am connected to some other peers in the network and maybe I know someone of those peers that starts with S. So I'm gonna go and I'm gonna say, hey, like you seem more likely than I am to actually store that piece of data. Do you actually have it? And that peer will answer, yes, I have it, here it is, or no, uh, I don't have it, but I am myself connected to some other people and I know someone who is even more likely than I am to actually store that data for you. In practice, you're gonna do a few hops on the network uh, and you're going to eventually get to the data that you're looking for that way. Uh, it is a very powerful idea and allows you to build uh, very big databases. Uh, everything is more or less optimized so that you keep your friends, the people that you're connected to, would be people that are both uh, close or similar to the name, the same name that you have, and people which are not similar to that name so that regardless of what piece of data you're looking for, you always have someone which is more or less likely to at least be more likely than you to have it. Um, how does IPFS use all of this? So if you want to, um, if you're adding content to IPFS, you will get those CIDs and you will insert them in the DHT, meaning that you will have to find a peer in the DHT, uh, which is happy, which is similar enough to that content ID to actually store it for you and serve as the, as the directory. You don't put the data, you don't put the actual data on the DHT, you just put the content identifier mapping to your peer ID so that when someone looks that up, they will see that it's your peer ID that has it. You additionally use the DHT to indicate where or how your peer can be contacted. Um, normally, in a peer-to-peer -peer application, in most of the cases, that would be like an IP address and a port, um, but you can also think that peers may be available through a different number of channels with a different number of protocols. So you may be a, a, able to access a peer through normal IP TCP, but you may also be able to access a peer through something like Bluetooth. And the idea is that you have to support all, all those things. So you will have this, in order to access content in the IPFS network to find content and to find where it lives, uh, you will have to make these two queries. First, to find which peer IDs actually provide that content. Second, to find where those peer are actually uh, reachable uh, so that you can uh, contact them directly. The last step in the process is that once you know where the content is, is living, uh, you can actually contact those peers directly and retrieve it. Since you're requesting by content identifier, 
um, what you can do is that every time you receive a piece of content, you can immediately verify that that piece of content you received actually matches the identifier that you requested by hashing it again. Um, it means that the content is authentic. Uh, any content that you receive in, the IPF, in IPFS because you request it with a content identifier and it has all these properties that is unique and so on, uh, it means that you can be sure that you get exactly the content uh, that you were lo looking for. Once you have that content, uh, you can yourself advertise it on the DHT and become an additional provider for that content so that other peers can actually find you and retrieve it from you. And this is where all the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, magic in the system works. In summary, um, we put things together like um, regular peer-to-peer -peer things like peers and DHT, um, which come for, from the lip 2 p project in particular. Um, all the formats representing the Merkle DAX to represent the folders and the files and so on, um, those are specified through the IPLD uh, project, which is interplanetary linked data. And then IPFS in particular also adds certain protocols, like the protocol to copy the data between peers. And using all those different building blocks, which can be used to build all sorts of peer-to-peer -peer systems, you end up having a distributed file system like IPFS, and you end up having a specific type of peer-to-peer -peer peer, which supports a specific set of services that other, peer, other IPFS peers in the network uh, can speak. Uh, additionally, that peer will provide an HTTP API so that other um, applications can build on top of it and can control it and can communicate with it and a few other things that I'm going to show. The key facts, seen, the key facts here is that all content is authenticated, uh, that you always get what you requested, that there are no central servers, everything is distributed, and that content is always downloaded on request. There is no one pushing content to you, you have to request it first uh, to become a provider for that content. Adding content does not require uploading. Uh, you don't even have to, to have an, an active internet connection at that moment because adding is just the process of getting the CIDs. And when you are able to contact the, another peer, when you are able to join the DHT, uh, then you will start advertising to the extent of your capacities. Um, as you saw, um, However, I told you that IPFS was there to upgrade the web. Um, we moved from a nice URL-looking thing to, to something like the IPFS protocol, a horrible-looking content identifier. And that's something I cannot even open in my browser because the browser it, it just doesn't know what to do with that. Um, so that hardly uh, upgrades the web at all. Um, so one thing that the IPFS uh, peer does when you run it is to also uh, launch a local web server that allows to access IPFS content from the IPFS network through the HTTP protocol. That means that the browsers can suddenly uh, obtain content from the IPFS network using the local IPFS gateway as provided by your IPFS peer. Um, so we move to now an HTTP URL, and that is at least something that the browser can understand. And now you can actually retrieve things like websites from the IPFS network using your browser, which is a very cool thing because you're not going to a specific location, you're retrieving it through a distributed file system. Um, second problem there is that no one is going to use that because that's very hard to remember. Machines may use that very successfully because machines can work with those hashes, but not humans. Uh, there are a number of ways to get around that, but thinking that if you have a look at domain.com, domain.com uses DNS to actually map to an IP address that no one remembers in practice. Uh, the cool thing is that you can also use DNS to map CIDs, content identifiers, to names that humans can remember. And we do that with something called DNS link. And suddenly we have a much better looking URL with a name that 
we can remember if you configure your domain to say this is an IPFS powered domain. This is a domain that can provide, that has a CID attached. That means that it can be obtained from the IPFS network. Um, you can use URLs uh, like that. And then the last trick here is that, well, also since domain.com is pointed to certain IP, so to certain remote IP, you can technically also make it point to the local IP to 127.0.0.1. And because the local gateway that the IPFS peer provides is actually clever about that, you can configure your domain in a way that is IPFS powered and it points to your local gateway. And there you have not changed anything. You have exactly the original URL for the content, except that now your website is peer-to-peer -peer powered. Uh, this is a hack, however, and anyone visiting that website will have to be running the IPFS peer for that to work. So um, it is an upgrade path, but it's not very smooth. Um, what we do in practice is to have something called the public IPFS gateways. We run public IPFS daemons uh, offering these servers um, publicly to the outside. And what you do in practice is to configure your domain to point to the public IPFS ser servers. And then, uh, with, the, with the help of a browser extension, um, that browser extension will detect if a domain is IPFS powered. And if you're running the IPFS daemon, or it can run it for you in the browser, it will actually fetch the content through the IPFS network. But if you're not running the IPFS daemon, if you're not using the browser extension, uh, it will use the public gateways to obtain that content, which, using the public gateways, uh, becomes, again, a location. It's not peer-to-peer -peer anymore, but it makes things work just like before, so you don't notice the change, and you have a uh, potentially peer-to-peer -peer power uh, website with a fallback option in case that person is not running an IPFS peer. Uh, we hope that in the future, browsers are way more clever about this and support protocols like IPFS or, or that uh, by default and are able to actually make that switch from you and detect like, hey, this is uh, content which is available through a distributed network. Uh, let's use that protocol directly without the need to, for the users to install um, additional things. Um, that's basically how IPFS works and, and serves to update the current web from a location address system to a content address uh, distributed file system. Um, I hope you enjoyed this and you understand. If you're interested to learn more about protocols and data structure, I, I highly recommend the Proto School tutorials. Uh, they're great. If you want to try IPFS, you can install the IPFS companion browser extension on, on Firefox, on Chrome. Um, you can install IPFS as a command line application, but you can also install it as a IPFS desktop uh, application that will hide all the command line things uh, for you. And if you want to play with this and other things, uh, I invite you to the IPFS cluster workshop at 2 p.m. that uh, we will just use cluster to collaboratively store content uh, on the IPFS network. Thank you very much. So we have time for questions. I'm wondering if people have an immediate, I see one over here, great. Okay, thank you for the talk. Um, so you said that um, this is a content-based addressing and um, you, you hash to 5.6 to hash the content. So do you think that at some point you will be running out of the space, just like we're running out of space for IPv4 um, say I can just take two to the power of two five six fives and hash them and put it on IPFS and other people won't be able to make any other files because I take all of the space. Sorry, running out of what? The, the, like the the hash space. Ah, um, you know, you will never run out of the hash space. The main problem there is that maybe the hashing function has some security vulnerability that hasn't yet been discovered that will allow people to create the same hash 
for two different pieces of content. This has already happened with um, other hashing functions. And therefore, you're, you cannot uh, ensure that the content that you're receiving is authentic, authentic because you may have several contents producing the same, the same content identifier. So you're always going to try to use a hashing function that you're reasonably sure that it provides you the same content, a different content identifier for each piece of content. Um, that said, IPFS is very modular and is very prepared also to, to make that flip and that upgrade to use a different uh, hashing function. It can actually generate CIDs using many different hashing functions and that should, that should work. But this, this is the main danger. You will never ha run out of a space in the hashing function domain though. Maybe this yeah, is so a good conversation, conversation to here. have over yeah. lunch. Uh, any are... other any other questions? I see one here. Hi, uh, this might actually be on a different level of the stack, but how do you deal with uh, content that has like versions or the concept of like give me the most recent version of this content? Um, uh, I see this as a, something that you build on top of IPFS. IPFS offers you facilities to do that. So we have something called IPNS, which um, instead of associating your CID uh, to the content, you associate like a signature of, of the content that can point to different CIDs in time. Uh, you can also use and update a DNS record to point to new versions of content by updating uh, DNS. And you can also uh, work through that using uh, gossip systems, like every time you update the version, you basically broadcast a gossip message to the, to the network. Um, so there are several strategies. It all depends on your requirements and how you want this, how persistent you want things to be and, and so on. Um, but there are ways to actually deal with uh, mutating content. So, basically updating the CID that people are, are accessing. In practice, since our, all our websites, for example, are deployed through IPFS, so what we do is update the DNS entries uh, to point to the new hashes all the time, and that works uh, fairly well for that use case. Um, can you talk about the differences between IPFS and DAT? Yes, I thought <laughs> someone will ask about this. So yesterday I read a little bit about that. Um, they're using very similar techniques and technology. Um, that uses, uh, it's more streamlined as, if you were here yesterday for the, that workshop, you can see how very well streamlined it is to publish things like, like websites. Um, but other than that, from my conversations with that people here, uh, that runs uh, DHT as well. That runs discovery servers, which is something that IPFS doesn't specifically have. Uh, but they said they're also facing out of discovery favor servers in favor of DHT. And that runs, they have a discovery key, which is a, a signature that you produce on your content, which will I think it's similar uh, to IPFS, but they also rely or can rely on DNS as a way of distributing the mappings between human names and discovery keys and so on. So uh, those are technologies that are quite uh, similar. Uh, IPFS, what I like about IPFS is that it's made out of many building blocks that you can potentially mix and match. And in particular, the P2P, IPFS has two implementations in JavaScript and in Go. Um, Leaf P2P has JavaScript, Go, Rust, I think it's getting C++ and, and so on. Um, so you have like a, a bit of a more extensive uh, ecosystem uh, to play around. But um, I think we're both players in this uh, distributed storage space and 
we all have like our use cases and the things we're trying to achieve and I don't see like it's like fantastic that we have that and that someone has figured out like a way to give the users a very straightforward way to participate in the distributed web is something that IPFS I don't think has been quite there in, in making it so easy for a final user to actually publish uh, a website. But Thank you for the talk. Um, so for the second year, we're running an IPFS live stream, which is awesome. But we've always been running into some issues with IPFS. Um, this year specifically, it seems that the network has gotten slower, uh, where we need a response time of about less than 40 seconds. Um, and if we try accessing a chunk from somewhere else in the network, it takes several minutes. Um, is this something that's being addressed? Um, and if so? Yes. Um, since a few months ago, we saw a huge increase in the number of peers in the IPFS network. That means a huge increase in the number of participants of the DHT. Um, however, in real world conditions, uh, in, a, in a happy world, you're always able to contact any peer. And they're all reachable, and they'll do what you want them to do. In the real world, you may try to contact a peer and it's no longer there, or it's behind NAT, or has a problem, or you have a bug in the code. Uh, all those things together, because the, the number of participating peers in the network went up significantly, uh, made uh, the DHT uh, become significantly slower. And this has all been heavily addressed. Uh, many improvements have happened, particularly users notice this when accessing content through our gateways because gateways are IPFS peers, and if gateways are primarily used to obtain, obtain content from the IPFS network, um, people notice immediately that it is very slow or that that is not working, and this is all uh, getting worked on. Uh, we're working as well on setting up a lot of testing infrastructure to actually verify that every change that we make to, to things like the DHT code, to things like the BitSwap code, uh, is actually um, producing improvements and not uh, going back. Something that is extremely difficult in peer-to-peer -peer systems, especially when you're trying to test as, at a scale of, we're talking many, many thousands uh, many, many thousands of peers in a network, uh, potentially up to hundred thousands of peers in the network. So um, this is getting worked on, but it's also not super easy, but uh, ch changes and fixes are dripping through slowly if you, if you follow up the development. And thank you for running IPFS streaming. It's like super cool that you're doing that. Okay, let's give Hector another round of applause. Thank you.